So thank you, thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you so much, Costas, for uh, inviting me. Uh, I think Costas and I know each other for over 20 years. We were doing all these things I'll show later. So, uh, so I'll be talking about neuromorphic uh, perception. This word neuromorphic now is blooming and I'll explain to you what it means and what are the motivations uh, behind this and why I believe it's the future of all sorts of sensing and, and novel AIs. And I will go through that. So probably an hour won't be a lot, but at least I can convey the ideas of which is important. Why am I doing this? Why do you think, I think that this is the future and what it will change. So to understand what I do today, I have to go back as Costa says to my interest. I've always been interested in brains. And when I finished my training in mathematics, I, in, 90, in the 90s, brain science was not that advanced as today. So I was, I was offered to do a PhD on trying to replicate eyes. And I liked it because I thought it would get me closer to the brain. And this book is fantastic. It's, called, it's by Michael Land. And he shows this is a distribution, basically. The higher is the mountain, the more eyes. There are many type of eyes in nature. And some are very successful, some are least successful. But the main story is like an eye is never a camera that you connect to a computer. Every eye adapts to its environment. And so the idea was in my PhD to design eyes and understand the geometry. Why, why do eyes see, for example, if you see a jumping spider, it has many eyes. They're completely looking in different direction with different resolutions. And it would be almost hard to match this today with a reasonable power budget. And this thing is burning very few pico to a few milliwatts. So how on earth is it doing it with such a high nonlinearity? And these are the questions I liked. And so you have to know that the eyes, eyes are the thing that has evolved, the organ who has evolved the most. Uh, and it's really, there's no generic eye. And, and I will always adapt to what you have to do. So that's the main story. So the whole idea of eyes is you need to, per, to get perception of the outside. And so the initial eyes were really flat, but over the years, uh, over centuries, or <laughs> the eyes start bending. So you can bend inward, like you see here, because it gives you directionality and this gives you a camera eye type. Or you can imagine you bend the other way around and you get an insect-like type, okay? And in the middle, there are different funny and weird eyes that are really specific to what the animals can do. So the best way to do this in the 90s was to play with mirrors. So this idea, I think you all know this, you put the camera here. This is from Hiroshi Shiguro back in the day. So this is a hyperbola. And you see the light come, reflects, hits the mirror and was is sent to a camera and the camera gives you something like this. So this is very, interesting because what really matters the geometry of the sensor is not the camera anymore the camera is just a collector uh, what really drives what you see is how you are bending light to send it to your collector and you can imagine that when when you start playing with surfaces you can decide i'd like to see a lot here nothing there a few there you can really decide the field of view you want and you can come up with the shape of a mirror that allows you to get that field of view. Okay, you get the idea. And it became, uh, we were, I think, two or three doing this, and suddenly it's super interesting for robotics because it gives you a direct perception of what's around you in one shot. And so uh, this field took off a lot, actually, at the end of 90s, early 2000, and then was disappeared slowly. I don't know why. For, I think I know why. But. So here is what brought me to do neuromorphic today. I think all of you follow geometry classes. This is uh, the pinhole model and people love it because you see all rays go to the one point and get projected on a plane. So the fact that this is how this camera works is uh, allows you to work with something called projective geometry that is absolutely fantastic to work in this type of spaces. And it's nice and it's, basically what cameras are today. This, on the other hand, is a, a, a section of that mirror. But look carefully, the mirror is here, see? 
is here between red and blue. And the green rays is a ray that goes from one pixel and basically tells you that when this ray comes from here, it gets reflected, we'll go to some pixel. It's basically green rays turns out to be sent to very specific blue ray. And when you extend all these rays, and like here, the rays don't intersect. You see that? And that's called the non-central camera. And every, every dot of the surface here is a focal point. So it's a multifocal point camera. And when you get into this world, the math as we know it, and the vision as we know it ceases to be, I would say, because this is a very simple way, but you can imagine a camera can be all sorts of surfaces, complicated surfaces, changing surfaces over time, like in our eyes. And there is no real math for this. And I was really fascinated by this problem because I would say 99% of eyes are really like this and not like this. This is real an approximation. And I was always wondering how small brains, in the case of multiple eyes, do these, solve these problems because it's close to impossible. So around 2000, I took the time to do something we never do, which is why on earth are we using images, right? How do we use images? What's, why am I doing computer vision with images? You know, questioning the fundamentals. And so it turns out that cameras as we know them, it's a very old invention, it's 1544. This is a, called the camera obscura. It was a room where people could see the projection. This exact pinhole you're studying or you did when you were a child. And this idea of this was quite interesting. People liked it, but it was, uh, it was something like a curiosity. People will go and say, oh yes, very nice. We can see the procession of the sun. And it could have been lost in history if it wasn't for painters. So painters found this idea great. And this is the ancestors of all cameras. This painter will hide into this box, put a piece of canvas, and would paint extremely fast, make more money and move from castle to castle instead of taking super long time. And the evolution over time was to replace this painter by pixels now, the sloppy optics by cheaper, lighter, more complicated optics. And there isn't between many things. This was a portable model. You would put a piece of paper here, etc. So this is just to show you that images are just an inheritance from art. This is, it's meant to take a picture and show it to somebody. That's it, this is where it all started. And so around 1877, Edward Muybridge, you should read his life, it's very controversial, had made a bet uh, with Stanford, the person who funded Stanford and created Stanford, that the horse, when he runs, lifts all his feet up. And so he took 10 cameras, delayed them, and took a snapshot, series of snapshots. And you can see he won the bet, obviously. But he got the idea, he was smart, that if you display them fast enough, you have this idea of video, of motion. So he called them motion picture. And again, you see it's an incremental quest. People could take one image, now they could take multiple images, and here we go. And why are images so bad, right? At least for computation, if you wanna show a picture, they're great. I'm gonna take this example of this picture here. So suppose you want to do an algorithm that sees the motion of this uh, picture, of this picture. And what you're gonna do is you will always have, as I show here in yellow and red, under and over something. Meaning, if you want to see the most fluid motion, you would like to have lots of frames, but that will cost you a lot to process them, acquire them, store them. And in the end, a lot of this uh, information you're getting is redundant, all the background is not moving. Um, and so that's really oversampling. And of course, today the frame rate relates to how much power you have. And so you wish you could process the fastest you can, but unfortunately it's a slider. So the problem is that you're spending lots of energy to acquire information, send it, store it, and then throw it, throw most of it. And it's a huge waste. And in the meantime, you're blind and you're burning lots of energy. So eyes don't work that way. And around 2003, 2004, I started 
getting interested in physiology and I, and I got this idea like if insects can do it with such a small power doing complicated things, there must be something me as a mathematician and engineer I'm not thinking of. And so why not go and see what the retina is doing? And so the retina is a very complicated piece of the brain. It's an inverted sensor, meaning the photoreceptor, the, 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 the um, photodiodes are at the back. It's a back illuminated sensor. And light has to cross all these layers, around seven layers of very complicated cells. And then this triggers a transfection of lots of computation happening and the surface layer creates the optical nerve and um, it's quite easy to do and to learn physiology of the retina you can put the retina in a dish these are all electrodes and you can measure the activity of the cells and believe it or not this is what the rigs looks like so you can have a video you can project it on the retina and you can get spikes which are events or information from neurons. And to this day, knowing what enters and what goes out, we still don't have a valid model of the retina. It's too complicated. And imagine this has no recurrencies. It's very simple. You can access every cell unlike the brain. And there is no model. So there is lots of complexity in biological systems. And so I decided that I would like to do engineering like people do conventional science. And I thought this is a perfect chance of, you know, uh, thinking of computer vision as a basic science. So like every basic science, I would like to observe, gather information, try to understand what I'm doing, draw the right experiments, model them. And then once you have a model, you can twist it and you can build things. And I, I thought there is a wonderful endless type of uh, things we could do if we can unveil how these biological system work. And so my lab is since yeah, over a decade now is shaped as the follows, which is quite unusual for an engineering lab. We do recording from brain and eyes. Then we do the models, which turn out to be silicon retinas or brain like computers. And so we model, we build hardware, and then we apply them. And so the obvious things is engineering. But the nice thing you can start to do is because your hardware looks exactly or somehow like brains, you can loop back to the brain and start fixing it. So for a decade, I've developed retina prosthetics based on this technology to restore vision for the blind. And it's, it's really nice. So I believe this configuration and this field of neuromorphic sensing allow you, allow engineers to become like in the broad basic science and really develop a link that is broken in vision between people who study biological vision system, record from them, and engineers who are only doing frames and GPUs and deep learning. There is something, there's something where we need to reverse engineer biology. And now is the perfect time because everything I'm showing you here is not very complicated. Data is all around and this is probably gonna be the century of the brain. So what is event-based acquisition? And I put so far because what you see around in this camera you can buy now is really based on this principle that people are not taught, which is a, a way to overcome that waste of information. And so instead of sampling on the time axis, what you want to do, or at least what people believe for part of the, sensors of our of the human body is are doing is that they are sampling on the other axis on the amplitude axis and so the idea is i'm going to send you an information and until that information has changed i don't need to send it to you again okay so if you ask me a question and you tell me riyad is somebody coming through the door i'm not going to tell you ten thousand times a minute that nobody is here Okay, not gonna tell you nobody's here, nobody's here, nobody's here, it's useless. Common people will tell you, there's nobody, I'll tell you when I see somebody and I'll sit here waiting and if I see something, you can do what you want, it's free and I'll scream and you know, I don't even need to tell you that somebody's here because we agreed on something. And this is the main idea, like don't go and systematically acquire information 
try to find what type of information you want, put it as low possible as you can. And if that person screams, you know who he is and you know what he means by that scream. You get the idea? And that gives you huge advantages because when information changes a lot, well, you get lots of samples. When information doesn't change, you got nothing. So you don't do nothing. You do nothing and you don't burn energy. You don't compute anything. So it becomes super efficient. And you, you see, this is an adaptive frequency device. It, it decreases the frequency of acquisition. It's even driven or data driven or scene driven. And when you do that, the most important information you have is time. When did that information come? So he said somebody's coming, somebody before said somebody's coming. So probably he's coming from that corridor over here. And I know when they screamed, so, and he's quite fast. So we have to run or, you see the idea of all this? No waste. You eat, you have to survive, and things has to be very quickly. And no wonder the brain is doing this. We wouldn't be here if we had to sample 10,000 times a second, the world or just energy wise, uh, latency wise, all that thing. So these event based camera now, they were built in two places, my lab and in and, and, and Switzerland. And now they really became a commodity. Most major manufacturer of camera in the world are now producing them. And it is, uh, they're all built on the same principle I showed you. There are some differences between them, but most of all, they are built on the same principle of detecting uh, uh, an amount of change. So it can be in, in the log space, some people will do it. all sorts of sensors out, out there, but the principle is the same. The one I really like, and it, it's not because it was from my lab, but it's, uh, it was used to call it a yeah, synchronous time-based image sensor. And this is how prophecy is built on. This is how we spin out prophecy. So this camera has every pixel here is independent. There's no clock. And every pixel is sensing constantly light. And as I showed you, if there is a significant change, the pixel will tell you, I've seen a significant change by five or 10% compared to my last measurement. But with this camera, and so you will get an event shown here, telling you, oh, I saw a change by 5% from my last measurement, as you asked me. But what this camera has, it is amazingly nice, is that it also gives you the gray level the amount of light at that location. And that gray level is encoded very nicely in the time domain. So the pixel tells you, I see a change. And when the pixel sees a change, he starts an integration over a fixed amount of photon, right? So you all agree that we want, give you a stupid example, a thousand photon, and then you tell me, how long does it take you to gather those photons? That will tell you how much light is out there. You got the idea, you have water dropping, you have to fill a well, how fast is it dropping? How fast is the well filling up? Pop, that tells me the flow. You get the idea? And so here the pixel says, I see a change. I start integrating the amount of photon you want, I finished. And the timing between the third and second event tells you how much light is out there, okay? And this is really nice because the number, the amount of gray levels you get is almost infinite because it's, uh, it's gonna be, you know, um, depending on time and time here is very precise. So the, the number of, um, how do I say, dynamic range is really huge, it's over 140 dB, okay? And it's in the time domain. So you don't need to play directly with gray levels. You can operate everywhere in the time domain is based on events coming. First event, the change. Oh, he starts integrating, he finished. And you can play with math in a new way. So this camera is not made anymore. But let me show you, this is for all cameras, why this is really nice, this technology, and why I think it's gonna change a lot of things. So here is a pendulum, and this is a toy problem. You wanna follow this little white dot and this is a chaotic pendulum. And you know, when you play with camera, if you face the sun, you can't see anything. You have to tune your integration time, right? And so what you see here is you have many problem with frames. One, as I said, is the massive waste of data. The second is the dynamic range that you always have to be 
be aware of integration time. And, but the third is motion blur, because when you are at 60 Hertz or hundred Hertz, the world is very, is faster. And so these things are not affected by, by motion blur because they're extremely fast. So an event camera is dating, is timing event at the microsecond. So the equivalent of one megahertz, okay? Now here, look, every pixel is telling you how much change happened from the last measurement. So a conventional camera, you have to make a choice, right? What's your integration time? Should I reduce the integration time or increase it? And so according to what you do, you can see portion of the scene and not the other way around, and you can play with that. But in the end, your range is very small where event-based camera are not affected by light. So think about it. Most of computer vision algorithm work really well, but they are light dependent. This sensor is reducing uh, data load, is, uh, is not um, affected by motion blur. And it's also completely independent from light intensity. So it's a, it's a dream camera. So here is the real space. X, Y, every pixel sees something new. So you get an image. And as things start moving in the scene, I'll show you later, every dot here is a, a pixel who saw a change of light and signaled it to you. And here the resolution can be very high, but for now it's around one microsecond. Okay, so we date events at the microsecond. The nice thing with this camera is you can generate gray levels, images when you want. And let me show you why is that. So this is the scene. Here is, this is updated. See here, the, this image, this video here is updated pixel per pixel at the time resolution of one microsecond. This is what's changing and every event comes with its gray level. And look how nice, this is a 30 image uh, sensor doing the same thing, how much data are we producing? And this is this camera. So this camera is running around a million times faster and producing around five to 10, sometimes 20% of conventional camera who is much, much, much slower. Okay. So as I'm here at grasp and pretty sure you, you, you like geometry, like I, I, I still like geometry and for Costas too. I know he, we worked a lot in this space. So a people are geometry, you all know what the people are geometry is. Yeah. No, you don't know. Okay. So imagine you have two cameras and you want to create depth. What you want is to be able to say, once you know the pose between these two cameras. So a camera is represented by the focal point and the plane, right? So if you want to find the match of this uh, pixel here of this, you, this pixel corresponds to a ray. And instead of going and looking by similarity measurements, so there are many techniques, which pixel could have, could look like this one in its neighborhood, you can reduce the search by saying, okay, this ray is some, this pixel is looking somewhere along this direction. If I project this direction on the other image, the, what he could be seeing, what, the other pixel on the other side could be anywhere along this line. You get the idea? And this is called an epipolar line. And this is really nice, but remember when you go to those funny sensors with many point of view and this is not gonna work. And so this is a classic, this is from the 90s. You see, you have that point. You don't know which point corresponds, but along this line, the point can be anywhere along this line. And, uh, and obviously it's this one. Anyway, so the fundamental matrix can be computed with this equation. This is all textbooks with a linear approach. And it's nice, but unfortunately it doesn't work on general sensors and, and, and it was something I really wanted to understand. So now this was my first paper in event-based. Uh, I got the idea of a new way of computing this, uh, this fundamental matrix. It turns out to be extremely simple. So imagine you have two cameras and it's an event-based camera, silicon retina. And remember, this camera is not sending you anything if there's nothing, right? So when something moves, you start getting things out. Nothing happened, you get nothing. So if you consider one pixel from camera one, the same story, somewhere along this line, there must be a set of pixels, but I don't know what they are. I don't wanna calibrate them. It's very hard for me. So what, what's the most general case? 
And so here, unlike a conventional camera, time is super important. Things don't happen at the same time, especially when you are measuring it at the microsecond. So your guess is, if this pixel is signaling there's a change, probably in the other camera, there must be a pixel who is also signaling a change at the same time, because they're seeing the same thing. You get the idea? So what you do is you can say, what's the probability for every pixel of this, of this camera to emit an event when this pixel fires, when this pixel sends an event? So you're just trying to compute the probability of two pixels from two different cameras to be active at the same time within a, a, a decent temporal uh, uh, interval. And when you do that and you compute this probability, here's what you get. You see that in the other camera, this pixel responds and this pixel also responds. And many pixels seems to be highly correlated in their activity with the pixel I'm interested in. And when you do, you merge all the probability for every pixel, here's what you get. All the high probability activation lie on the line, which is something you expect to happen, right? It's exactly, this is the pure geometry of the sensor with no hacks to you know, reduce the matrix or no, you're not lost in anything. It's completely correlation, time correlation between two pixels. And if you consider these complicated system, these as really highly non-central sensors and you do the same thing, what you find out is you can start seeing very, uh, I would say nonlinear fragmented epipolar lines. And this one, they're not even epipolar lines. They are, they are just coactivation. So you see what I mean? You can consider any sensor and the system will wire itself. So there's a very funny experiment if you have time. There's a person who inver inverted his field of view. Do you know that experiment? He put the mirror here and instead of looking at the world this way, he started looking at it from above, no, from, uh, yeah, from, uh, from beneath, because, you know, mirrors do a reflection. So th the first week he couldn't even walk. So he, people need to help him. And after a few months, his brain completely rewired and he could even ride the bicycle. You see what I mean? So it's the essence of calibration. And I really like this paper. It's something I enjoyed. So now once you have that, you know, you know the correspondence between pixels, at least you can reduce the search. How do you do stereo on such system? Well, it's on the same principle, right? You can say, if this pixel fires and another pixel fire along his people line, probably they're a good match. That's all you do. And you can add few constraints above them. And what you get, I'm gonna skip this, is something like this. This is stereo, something happened. I'm trying to slow it down for you so you can see it. And everything you see here is a 3D point. This is a cube thrown in the air and there's a hand grabbing it in real time. So to my knowledge, this is the fastest stereo uh, in the world because this is working event per event, right? There's no batching and you're not burning a lot. This used to be a product of Chronocam, but for strange reason, they ditched it. And here it is in action on the, on the car. So this is disparity. Pixels are, are color coded. If they're red, they're really close. And if they're dark blue, they're really far in the middle and all between. So you see what you get is basically edges. And these edges, you really have their motion very precisely because think that every event here is timed to the microsecond. And you'll see funny things when the car will stop, everything will disappear and you'll only get, this is around my former institute in Paris. So you get basically, this is a change information and, and you get cheap stereo actually, very cheap stereo and very fast, extreme low latency, low power. I'm gonna show you when the, camera, the car stops. It's really funny to watch. Oop, let me go further. You see the car stops at the traffic light and 
all the rest disappears. Remember, you don't need to send me 10,000 times on information I have already. So now, when you have such camera, you have two ways to go. If you want to, go, to be as efficient as possible, the, the place where you should start thinking is, I have computed something, whatever it is, and just one pixel change, just one pixel change. What am I going to do? Am I going to compute again for that pixel? It will be unsustainable. So the best way is to rethink computation as an incremental process, meaning I am computing something, and each time something comes, I update it. The other option is to say, hmm, this is too complicated. So let me go back to frames or let me take lots of events together. And there you start losing the advantages of the sensor because you need to store, you need memory, it's gonna get slower, right? So in the most pure way, you would like an incremental. Small changes, small updates. Uh, another thing that goes in this direction, this is an unpublished paper, but here is the memory, the useful memory occupation. So if you take, uh, if you keep all the, all the pixels and you put their time, you can see that the useful information is around 8% of the whole focal plane for most of the databases people use in this field. Sometimes it's even 1%, meaning if you allocate the whole plane and you start computing, that plane contains 95% of useless information. So you're burning power to maintain that memory alive and it's not useful for much. Okay, so I don't know, I won't go, I wanted to show you the, the, the idea of how to compute, but there is, uh, we've been doing this in my lab for now over 14 years or 15 years. So we have, we've written, I would say most of what people have done in computer vision. Here is something uh, funny. This is uh, everything I show you here is done event for event. So this is done in the world of events, but show you the results. So it's an ICP. So if the IP closest point, you know a shape and you want to follow it. So you have occlusions, you have dynamic things. This car is white on a white track, which if you only use gray levels, you're, you're done. And this is a frame-based implementation from OpenCV. And you see, it's extremely hard to go against occlusion uh, when colors are the same, gray levels are the same. Whereas in this case, it's almost straightforward. And this is straightforward because, because your, time, your time axis is so high, it's so precise that the trajectory of the two cars in space-time are super different, although they look the same. You see what I mean? You're not doing jumps of pixels. You are really spanning a nice surface of events. And even if the car and the truck intersect, they are still on a different trajectory, different velocities, and you can do better estimation. And you can even extend these type of things to moving cameras. So you can uh, follow this uh, star here where the camera is moving, everything is moving because the velocity of the background and the foreground is so different that the algorithm cannot be mistaken. And you can, this is, I, I know uh, Mrs. Bakshi is here and this is called pictorial model. It's a, a set of trackers linked by springs. It's a very nice model from the 70s. It's called part-based models. And it's extremely hard to make this thing work in real time. And here, as you can see, not only does it work on real time, it works on every event. And we're able to solve this equation locally by small increments and make this pictorial model work pretty well. You can also do pose estimation. Here we know the object and we want to estimate the position of the camera related to the object. So there is a, a whole suite of paper that explain to you how to handle this type of problem. How do I update my pose if I know my object and I got one event? How do I move it slowly? So can you explain a bit more how to correspond the tracking? Oh. Oh, in the tracking here. So what you do, um, you mean in the um, in this one, right? So it has to start here. So what you do is, of course, there's a problem of initialization. You have to at least start not far. And what's going to happen is you get events, 
and you do the, the closest algorithm, the, you try to look for the closest point around this, this uh, shape, right? And then you find the vector and you just steer up by decomposing into the, the rotation and translation matrix by a small amount. And what you end up seeing is that the shape is gonna go, the ICP is gonna go event per event at little steps. The only thing you have to adjust is how fast are you gonna go? And that you can auto adjust by seeing how many events you get from the object, meaning you know the velocity really well. So it ends up being a small process where you always follow this shape. In 3D, you do the same thing. So you have a pixel, you see a new event coming, you know your shape is somewhere. And so you emit a ray and you say, probably because my temporal resolution is so high, this object has to go this way. And you impact on every uh, component of the rotation and translation and you update the, the pose of the camera to, to do that. So it is always event per event if you wanna go super fast and, and keep low power. And it's what really saves and make this algorithm extremely simple is the high temporal resolution. Once you're there, for example, if you want to compute optical flow in a conventional movie or the jumps between two frames can be 15 pixels, 10 pixels. But here it's almost continuous. So you don't have to compensate for the the absence of information of 60 Hertz or hundred Hertz. It becomes almost continuous compared to this signal. Um, this is something I really like. This is a PNP model also updated, written in event per event approach. Uh, I had the PhD, we had fun. We, we went through all the post things and tried to rewrite them in event based. And all the papers are there. If you're interested, you can always write me. This is something really funny and unique. Uh, let me show you. When you look at human beings, we, we blink eyes a lot. You blink between five to 40 times per minute, depending what you do and your level of concentration. And when you look at the dynamics and the uh, meaning, the number of events you get when you blink, it's very characteristic. It has a unique signature telling you how light increases and how light decreases over time. And this shape here is almost unique to all human beings, right? If you look at the dynamic of the eye, if you see my eye and record it with event-based camera, and you see how many events do I get from this camera over a small time beam, the signature is what do you see here, okay? And so now what you want to do is you want to put the simple tracker and avoid drift by ensuring that a human being is there because the dynamic signature of a human being is unique. And if you have two of these shapes, as you see here in red, meaning you're 100% sure there's a human being. So you don't need to spend lots of energy to look for faces in an event-based scene because of this uh, temporal and high temporal resolution dynamics of eye blinks. And you can extend it to let me show you multiple ones. See, you can, you can really infer there's a face just by the dynamics, no computation, no machine learning, nothing, just the dynamics. Okay, so now the question is, how do you do machine learning? So, yes? What's the factory? Yes, No, I mean, yes. So what you do is you, you initialize many things and you have a Gaussian distribution. So when an event comes, you can compute to which distribute, to which tracker he belongs roughly based on the value of his Gaussian probability of belonging to somebody. And then you update that guy or you update the two because you don't know sometimes he belongs to both. So his contribution can be you know, distributed uh, along the trackers. So machine learning, how do you do machine learning? One way is to do it is to create frames and send it to a GPU, which is, as I said, not very efficient. And this is, I believe, the most interesting feature of event base. It's called a, a time surface. And so this is the camera, this is the ATIS. What I'm showing you here is 
uh, a disk rotating with two, two lines. And here, every event is color coded according to when he arrived. So white is very old and uh, white is very recent and, and red is very old. You get the idea? So it's rotating. And each time I get an event, I color code its time of arrival. And here's what's happening. See, pixel x0, y0 told me he saw something. And pixel around him saw also something, but at different times. So information lies in the timing between these events, right? And so you want a way to express this exact configuration of events and their time delays. And the way you do it is you put an exponential decay. And when the event comes, you want to know how far in the past he's related to you. So if the value is high, he means he's really close to you. And if the value is very low, it means he's really far from you. Okay. So around every incoming event, you can define a vector here that corresponds to the value of the exponential of the people that surround you. And this value here tells you, for example, okay, this pixel is the one who just came, his value of one, but around him, the blue pixel fired not far, is maybe related to his activity. You see what I mean? This is a temporal description of delays of precise delays between events. And so here's how you do machine learning. And this is very close to what I believe brains are doing. So you got event, and each time you get an event, you compute this thing here that turns out to be a surface, right? So zero, zero is the pixel who just uh, send you an event. And around him, it tells you the value of who fired not far from that pixel, okay? It's called the time surface. And what happened is this architecture works as following. So forget the two layers for now, just look at layer one. For every pixel that sends you an event, you compute that time surface. And what you end up doing is clustering them, which are the most representative time surfaces in my, in my scene. And here for, I mean, to explain you better, you can see there are four main time surfaces we find for this moving digit. This one seems to be active on the sides of the eight. This one seems to be active on the oblique part of the eight, et cetera. And what you do now is when you get, so you compute these canonical time surfaces. And now each time you get the time surface, you want to know to which one it corresponds, right? I got the new time surface, which one? Oh, it's time surface number one. And now you emit an event again. So the output of layer one is telling you an event came and it corresponds to in that pixel and around that pixel, it's a feature number three that is active, okay? And this time, so layer one is also sending you events, but this time the events are not pixel activity, it's feature activity. And what you want to do is you keep doing the same process, but you increase your integration time, meaning when a feature comes this time, I'm going to look larger in the past to see how these feature combine. See? And so now the time surface here is no longer telling you how pixel work, is how features from that location are combining over time with precise timing. Okay? And you can cluster again and emit new spikes. And this time, the layer, third layer is how the features of the feature combine to create more complicated feature over longer time scales. You get the idea? So it's a deep temporal network working on the very precise pattern in time and space telling you what's happening there. And you can see as you go deeper that for example, this time surface is really active to a small portion moving in a specific direction at a specific speed. And the deeper you go, the better description you have, which is a dynamic description of what's happening in the scene, okay? And look, this is layer one for many characters moving, like imagine the post office. And you can see layer one has few features. Those features combine over time to create more complicated feature and even more complicated and specific features. And in the end, as you keep going deeper, your integration time increases 
And you can put like a simple classifier in the paper. I put histogram just to show you the complexity. I mean, this whole pipeline is doing a lot and you don't need the classifier. So row things, and you can see that the distribution over time for the last layer is quite unique for every object or everything you observe. And that helps you basically define uh, this new type of machine learning. This is in a nutshell, something very close to what neurons in real life in the biological system do. Neurons learn where is that information coming, how important it is, and what's the time delay that you need to consider to have something meaningful to you. So neurons in the end, we believe, are sensitive to precise patterns of information over time. So this algorithm is very used and you can use the time surfaces as a good feature. It really helps you for a variety of things, including stereo. And it's something nice. And you have a whole suite of, along this algorithm here that people have added to. And there's a recent paper that really improves the whole system. And as we speak, we improve the feedback too, right? Because there is lots of feedback. Okay, so another thing, I don't know how much time I have left. 10 minutes, maybe? I think it's my phone, I'm sorry. <laughs> so one thing I'd like to show you is once you get into this world and you make the effort of trying to understand how biology works, you really start getting into a world of neuroscience because this type of sparse information, this idea of working on a time brings you to very close to what biologists and what the neuroscience world is doing. And one thing I worked on a lot was to convince people to, that these cameras are the best to restore vision. They're copied from eyes. If somebody becomes blind, I can speak the language of the brain and therefore I can come back to the brain and send information he understands. So there are two main diseases when people lose vision in their retina. One is it's a genetic disease where um, your field of view restricts until you become blind. And the second is when you age, you start losing vision in the center and that's increasing and you become blind. So inward from the outside or from the inside and outward. And in general, it's not really understood, but what happens is you lose the sensitive part of your retina. So there are many endeavors to, to restore vision, some failed. Uh, some are, I would say, semi-successful. So people like to go on the surface of the retina. It's called epiretinal. People like to go under the retina. Uh, it's called subretinal. Some people try to connect to the optical nerve. It's really hard because this, all the fibers are scrambled, so you don't know what you're doing. Some people start to say outside the eyeball. I cannot really tell you which one is the best because we're really, really, really far from getting something that could do anything close to what you're doing now we're looking at me. And so the main challenges when you start is of course, trying to understand what brains are doing with visual information. And it's a good start to send them information in the time domain, as I showed you, because it's how things work. There's a, the most difficult part I would say is how to target cells if I want to talk to you or I want to play, um, if I want to, to make you listen to music. If all, if I have an orchestra and I am a, as a conductor, I say everybody to play at the same time, the same notes, it's gonna be a mess, right? What you make music is people don't play the same thing, don't play the same thing at the same time. And unfortunately today, the electrodes are so large that you're just flooding information in there and you're sending, you know, you're exciting the whole retina. This is a device I have built uh, with my team and it's an event camera. This is fully neuromorphic. One event goes to this pocket computer and then talks to an implant in the eyeball of the person. Let me show you what this looks like. See, this lady here is blind and she has been implanted with an implant in her eye. And unfortunately, when you turn on the camera, what they see is not what they used to see. So they have to relearn how to grab things. What's the, 
you know, the hand-eye coordination, and uh, it's extremely new for them. So you need lots of uh, training, excessive number of training. So one thing is to train them how to what how to reconnect the hand and the eye, the hand-eye coordination, and then slowly they start uh, they start learning and how to use it until they can take it home. This is what the implant looks like. It goes on the outside of the eyeball, and then there's an incision and it contacts the cell and it talks to them electrically. Yes. So all these diseases imply that your optical nerve is alive, is still there. If you go to the cortex, it's a different story. And uh, another thing you probably will hear about is called optogenetics. It's something where you can transpect neurons uh, with some piece of DNA, and those neurons become active to light, but not ambient light. You need lots of light. And so if you can make neurons that don't react to light, sensitive to light, you can imagine that you can make the retina work again, right? There's another thing, which is like a solar panel that goes under the eye. And so we started developing goggles, not the RVR goggles, but actually these are goggles that project uh, sub-millisecond temporal information inside the human eye. And they were, they are actually a, a recent paper used them and it's part of a huge endeavor to restore vision. So it's, um, I believe this is the fastest event-based display uh, for uh, sight restoration. It takes very little to bring it to an AR VR system. Um, yeah, and as Costas mentioned, I think since I moved to Pittsburgh, I start working with Andy Schwartz to decode the motor cortex. And it's easier to read than to write because to read the information is highly redundant. And because no one's don't talk at the same time, even if your electrode is large, you know who is speaking because they don't speak the same way. So you have higher chances to read than uh, when you have a huge microphone just to talk to him or to you specifically, you see what I mean? We don't have the technology to send information to every cell today. It's extremely hard. So this field is, has the potential to change many things, um, you know, mobile phones, autonomous driving, AI, this new type of AI that's totally asynchronous in the time domain. And uh, yeah, so I think I have one minute to go. So it's, uh, there's a real, I think paradigm shift in the way we can think of the brain and AI and get closer to what brain are doing. And uh, there are many sensors you can use this type of technology on a radar, LIDAR. Any sensor you have out there can be made event-based. And last but not least, you, when you type neuromorphic, you always fa fall into this idea that we have to build new computers. So as you know, a computer is spending 80% of energy bringing information from the memory to the processor and bring it back to memory. So if I had the calculator in my hand and I was a computer scale, my information would be in Australia. So each time I have to do 12 multiplied by 30, information has to flow from Australia to here. I compute and I send it back to Australia. And maybe sometimes I'll store it in Paris. Okay, that's cash. So it's terrible. And this architecture is called the bottleneck of von Neumann. So what people are trying to do is to overcome this and get something with brains where memory and computation are at the same place. And it's a huge endeavor. And you can see Lohi and all those people going there. Uh, just for you, if you're interested, this is a, a framework that allows that type of computers to to become, um, I'm sorry, I'm going to turn this thing off, to turn any neural processor into, into a, a computer. I think I'm done. If you have any question. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> I just forgot to turn it off. Uh, thank you. And as always, amazing talk.
Thank you. Uh, I'll be handling questions in person. Anthony's going to be checking this uh, Zoom Q&A, so please toss some questions up there if anybody uh, in the remote audience has any. So who'd like to start? Um, I, I guess this is related to how uh, events are uh, stored uh, in long-term memory. So uh, as you mentioned uh, in the stereo paper, uh, there's a way to use a timing-based matching to match the features, but uh, humans can actually recognize the same thing that you have seen before. Um, so I wonder like how uh, these events are, uh, or like signals are saved in, uh, in memory. Uh, for example, in odometry, uh, we'll have to run like loop closure uh, because uh, we can run loop closure because image features are pretty, pretty much frozen in time. Sure. But let's say, um, if we want to do this in the event world, what kind of uh, robust features we uh, we need to look at in order to uh, match like global uh, match features globally? So your your question is about how much features you need or what you need to store, right? Yes. Okay. So if you want to compute anything, suppose you want to compute a pose and store that uh, motion over time, you can still do it. That's going to cost you memory. What I'm saying is events are coming and you want to update, compute whatever you want at the cheapest level, both in memory and in power consumption. So which is related, right? The only thing I'm saying is what people do sometimes, they store lots of events in memory or they do a frame with it, right? So 90% of the papers today have frames and, and they work operate on frames to send it to a GPU. Some people have long buffers where they store the 2000 last events to do it, which is something in between. I'm saying that the most efficient way to update your computation is to write that such a one event comes, you update whatever you're doing. It's not gonna change what you want to store in your algorithm, right? It, 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 the thing is it would cost you less to update it at one megahertz than to update it considering longer time scales or lots of events. And that's the big problem today, right? And both work, but you won't prevent you. So you, in theory, you should, you should update your pose every event. That's gonna cost you less than storing all these events and doing batch computation on it. Welcome. Hi, uh, thank you for your talk. Um, my question is about um, kind of applying the event-based cameras. So. I think some uh, obvious application is self-driving cars, obviously uh, helping people see is the one you talked about. What are kind of the trade-offs in terms of like safety um, using event-based cameras versus just uh, standard uh, cameras? Safety in uh... As a safety in terms of like the um, amount of data that you collect using event-based cameras is less, which is a feature of the camera, but also there could be a trade-off with uh, the safety of um, like, so if you're in a self-driving case, uh, if, if the car is not seeing all the data it can, then there's an issue there with maybe it's missing something. Um, or uh, in the case of uh, people being able to see again, um, what if uh, the, they're not able to see like all the frames, but they only see things that are moving. I mean, I, I'm just wondering if there's any oh. work being done on safety in regards to event based camera. I don't think, um... Think about it that way, right? So if you, the best metaphor is I call the castle metaphor, the castle. Suppose you're a king in the middle ages and you have a castle, you would put uh, walls around your castle to stay safe and you would put uh, soldiers on the uh, looking if somebody is gonna attack you, right? The way systems are built today, that system of the guards to alert you if somebody is gonna attack you works with a drummer. So you put the drummer, each time there is a drum beat, everybody, every guard sequentially tell you what they see. So a normal guard will tell you, I see a mountain, I see a tree, I see a meadow, blah, and, blah, and again, and again, and everybody's telling you again, the same things again, and again, and again. The place is gonna be unlivable. And suppose something happened, you say, I see a knight coming. Oh, did he see a knight? Is it noise? I don't know, let me wait. So you wish to tell him, hey, are you seeing, you can't, you have to hear to everybody again and go back to him to say, are you seeing a knight? He says, oh, yes. You have to wait again, <laughs> you see, it's a loss of time. So the thing is you would get rid of the drummer and you say, hey, if you see something higher or looks like a human being, just shout your name and I know where you are and I'll 
react faster. So you, there's no fear because you already have the information. You just don't want to receive it 10,000 times if it's the same. That's the main line. So now if you think of display, yes, correct. I display something to your eye and you have many strategies of display. You can say, I know that what I send you in the brain is gonna last 100 milliseconds in there. So if it didn't change, and on 100 milliseconds, I'll update this information just because your system works like this. But if you're an algorithm, you don't care, right? Because you're not gonna decay. Information is gonna fade out. So you're computing, I'm giving you a value. As long as I didn't update it, it's still the right value. If it goes down, I will tell it to you. If it goes up, I will tell it to you too. In the meantime, relax. So one question um, from our virtual audience we have is, have you considered using event-based cameras for a sensory substitution, um, such as turning the output of an event-based camera into sound? Yeah, people did that, uh, not with sound. Uh, we, did it with, uh, we did it with haptics, you know? When you, it's unpublished work. And so when you were young, remember you used to write on your phone hand and uh, there's a huge, uh, uh, literature on that thing. And it didn't work really well for the reason that if I press a shape on your hand, you have no idea what it is. But if I write it, if it's, you know, you add time to it, it becomes reasonable. So we restored vision by taking those events from the camera and send them to the, the skin with timing. And people could do the same, could provide the same results as the implants but the device costs a hundred dollars to do around. So, yes. Um, uh, I would like to ask about the neural network that was using events. Uh, every layer sends out one uh, uh, exponential kernel or a, a spike with an exponential decay. Now, um, do you believe that the recurrence in the brain is really some sort of a repeater that gives you spikes from the lower layers back into the higher layers, because uh, the higher layers, if they want spikes that are older, there is no way to get them, right? You have lost them. Uh, the amount of time it takes to go up the layers uh, is some finite time and you will lose all spikes that are shorter than that or that decay quicker than that. Um, so let me see if I can answer your question correctly. It's, uh... What happens is um, your integration time is increasing as you go deeper. Mm -hmm. That decay is gonna be longer and longer. So the lower layer, for example, we have done statistics on this world based on events. What is the maximum uh, amount of information to take as much information as possible from this world? And it's around a decay of five millisecond. Five millisecond gets you with that first layer with significant uh, time surfaces. Then what happened is those time surfaces, meaning, hey, I've detected this dynamic pattern in the scene. When you detect that pattern in the scene, you emit a new event. And that pattern is gonna last for a while, and then it will change. And it's gonna be pattern number five. So now you have pattern number five coming after pattern number two, but 10 milliseconds later. And this is happening in other areas. So what you get is events in, events out, but the event out is not telling you, you're integrating over larger and larger time scale on space and time. So the second layer now, when you do a time surface is no longer is telling you in that pixel, you had feature one and then three, and it's like music, you see, it's the timing matters. And the deeper you go, integration time gets longer. So here's the thing. If you look at the low layers at the five millisecond, very noisy, things flicker, jump, because you know you have noise, systems can be noisy. But the deeper you go, they create momentum. And so the feedback is basically ensuring that when you see me, you not alternate between uh, alien, me, my mother, somebody else you know, I'm stable in your brain. Your input is not stable, it's very noisy, and stability comes from going deeper and stabler over time. This is a machine learning that works on time and time matters. So the deeper layer are telling the other one, hey, relax. I know 
it is you. And so everybody propagate back and try to remove, to stabilize the system. Have you built something like this? Yeah. Oh, very cool. And, and this works real time and we've used it. Uh, on... By, by uh, something like this, I meant the one with recurrence. Yeah, yeah, it's topic. ongoing. We're finishing it. I'm, I'm very slow because I like to enjoy new things <laughs> and see where they go. Uh, but, just, but you yeah. see the idea, right? As you go deeper, it's like you, you run, you want to catch the bus. So you see how many people are waiting. Is there a bus coming? Oh, what time is it? What day is it? You'd start integrating queues on longer and longer time scales. And this is exactly what this thing is doing. Uh, thank you, Riyad. Every time I learn something from your talk, I will stay on the very basic thing that uh, all the curriculum on signal processing and control is based on regular sampling. Yeah like in uh, Shannon's theory, Nick with Shannon's theorem and pretty much everything. So what is the state of the art on irregular times? Let's say just with time, time sampling. C control? And uh, signal processing, yeah. So as far as I saw, when we started, honestly, there was nothing. All the bases were, I mean, doing, vi the first time I sent a paper to Pami, I won't say who the editor in chief was, he replied to me, are you telling me you're trying to do vision without images, without gray levels, <laughs> and just with sparse information? I said, yeah, and he said, this is not vision. So <laughs> this is where we came from. There was nothing. In signal processing, there are very few work where people basically interpolate the data, try to approximate and create resampled data. There's lots of papers. There's a real uh, pioneer in the 80s who thought of signal processing on time domain. He's, it's uh, Cividis in Colombia. And he did chips about them. And, but he got the approach more of the signal processing, like writing filters and updates. And, but not much actually is happening. Control theory have a PID, a synchronous PID. I had the student, I had the postdoc who did a beautiful, beautiful paper on control, on event-based control that is uh, out there. And, I think it's a nice way people are taking it and building on it, but not much actually. We're not, uh, it doesn't tick many boxes. And, and people are quite reluctant to go and think time. One update, one thing takes a lot of time to think of an algorithm, but that's the best way to do it, I believe. Yeah, so this is. Another question from the virtual Q&A. Um, right now, event-based cameras simply pass on events to the host-based camera for processing. What is the plan to move sort of feature detection and first layer filtering closer to the camera such that you're not actually sending out these events at such a high, high, high frame rate yeah, so, um, to really see the realization of events? So biological retina work that way. We have at the lower level, some feature being extracted. And uh, unfortunately, if you want to do them in hardware, it's gonna cost area, it's gonna be super big and the resolution is gonna be not very high. So maybe with the 3D stacking, now, now we can put many layers of electronics. You can imagine, so now the cameras, in my days when we were doing them in the lab, you had the photodiode and the whole logic was around the photodiode. So the, the area of the pixel that is useful is really small, 10%, 5%, you see? So now what's, and so the, quantum efficiency of these pixels were, were not great. So now the new sensor people buy have one layer where you only have photoreceptors and the electronics is one layer beneath, right? To increase and remove and get a better camera. So yeah, at some point people will get closer, but what is sure is when uh, ganglion cell fire, they fire for very precise features and precisely in time and precisely in features, just not, feasible today with our technology, at least at good costs. Uh, another question from the virtual audience um, was the surprise of just seeing in the videos you showed with a uh, moving vehicle that you would think nearly all the pixels would change nearly all the time since everything is moving, but instead it looked fairly sparse by tracking edges. Are there any parameters that you need to tune to get this experiment to work, perhaps as raising the threshold um, of what illuminance elicits a data update. I missed the two cent last two sentences. Um, just saying overall, uh, you would think that all the pixels would be active or all the events would be active given moving uh, a moving vehicle and moving things in the scene. But we see overall it's fairly sparse yeah. um, and we're able to track these edges. 
did you have to tune anything in order to get this to work? Like um, the trigger you used for a data update for an event? So no, but you need to tune your uh, the biases of your camera. The one that come with the camera are not optimal. So normally you have a bias file and you try to make it work with your lighting condition to what you have, but yeah. So you have temporal edges, at least for these sensors, you might get something fancier. Yeah, um, I, I like your computation of time. That's novel. However, you are computing first derivative. What about second derivative? I mean, all the abrupt changes that are concern of us who work in control of safety comes from acceleration. Yeah, so uh, I agree. <laughs> the thing is, uh, the temporal resolution is one microsecond. So uh, the sampling, uh, so when an edge moved with the resolution, each time we computed the acceleration locally, it was close to zero because you're sampling so fast that you don't have the high jumps like you. Yeah, you could do that, but uh, mm, yeah, m m I, I think velocity is more important because of the time scales, and, and nothing in the world is that fast. Yes, I'm doing kinematics. Yes, we say dynamics, I agree, it's an abuse. <laughs> Yeah. But this world, yeah. Rarely in this world, this camera is, everything is slow for this camera to see a real acceleration. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much to everybody that joined us today. Uh, please tune in next Friday, November 12th at 10.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time for our next Grasp on Robotics talk featuring Cynthia Matuzek uh, from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. For more information on upcoming events, be sure to follow us on social media or check out our website. Thank you again and have a wonderful day. Thank you.